Good afternoon and a warm welcome to you all. My name is Pierre Schlosser and I have the privilege to introduce and moderate this online seminar. Today I'm in the company of Jerome Zettelmeyer from the Washington-based Peterson Institute for International Economics. Welcome back, Jerome. In the presence also of Jean pisani ferry from the European University Institute, Jean is holder of the Tommaso Padovas Chiopa chair here at the UI and he is also a professor at Sciences Po Paris and the Hertie School of Governance. Welcome, Jean. Last but certainly not least, Henrik Enderlein from the Hertie School of Governance and the Jacques Delors Institute Berlin. Welcome, Henrik. Many thanks to the three of you for being with us today. Before introducing the topic of today's seminar, I'd like to tell you a bit more about our school as we have several activities in the pipeline that would be of interest to you. The Florence School of Banking and Finance is a program of the UI, which, as you may know, is a postgraduate public and international research and education institute located in Florence, Italy. The UI offers PhD programs in social sciences since 1972, and more recently, is also providing executive education courses to practitioners. The FBF focuses precisely on executive education and is a place of debate, learning, and exchange, a place where the new and the older generation meet to discuss and argue about cutting-edge topics of financial stability, risk management, as well as recent issues of banking regulation, supervision, and resolution. All this for Europe's common good. In this spirit, I want to inform you about our next lecture on the 15th of March with Sabine Lautenschläger from the ECB and about our, our, and about our annual conference to be held on the 26th uh, April. It will focus this year on institutions and the crisis, topical. The conference papers will be then, like every year, published in our blue book, which is here, sorry, also available on our website. In terms of training, so far our school has trained more than 1,100 professionals. They are mostly active in central banks and banking supervisors. We have several residential courses coming up next, which should be of interest. In March, we will host a training course on macroprudential policies with Nobu Kiyotaki from Princeton University. April, as always, will be a busy month. We'll have a course on the supervisory review and evaluation process with our partner, the EBA. A course then on leverage cycles, asset prices, and crises with Moritz Schularik from the University of Bonn. And last but not least, a course on sovereign debt risk and restructuring with Mitu Gulati, Lee Bohait, and Jerome. As you will see, several other training courses are lined up until the summer, so stay tuned and do not wait too long to register. Okay, so let's now move over to you. Uh, you who are right now in front of your computer, smartphone, or tablet, you are probably at work, at home, or in a cafe, you are about around 120 participants connected today, following us everywhere in Europe and the world. We have 35 nationalities represented. We have this time many people from several national central banks, as well as from the ECB, the Single Resolution Board, the Commission, and others. 36% of you are women, 64% are men. You have almost nine years of professional experience on average. Most of you are trained economists, but we also have lawyers, and other profiles with us. Lastly, most of you have a master's degree, while 29% of you have a PhD. Right, the topic of today's online seminar is the reform of the euro area, almost an old-timer issue, you might say. However, one can argue that the euro area finds itself right now at a defining moment in an odd situation between two storms. On the one hand, the euro crisis is over and economic conditions have improved. On the other, future crises are always around the corner and they will be testing and they will be testing the solidity of the euro in due course. So in that context, some have argued that this sunny moment would be a good period to substantially reform EMU. Why are institutional reforms needed at all? Well, there seems to be quite a consensus on the fact that despite the creation of an unprecedented crisis management arsenal, Europe's economic and monetary union is still far from being a rock-solid architecture. But let's see what your views on this are. Where there is generally more dissensus is on how to make EMU bulletproof and on which kind of reform is needed to bring it to steady state. And there are plenty of different perspectives on how to reform EMU out there, but to simplify, let's pretend that there are two opposing views in conflict here. The Brussels view, which in a nutshell advocates EMU state building and risk sharing, this may or may not be the Paris view or indeed the Rome view, 
we might find out today. And on the other side, the Berlin view that dismisses the possibility of major institutional reform without treaty change and advocates risk reduction and market discipline. In this context, 14 German and French economists came up together with a proposal to bridge those differences. They have formulated what can be looked at as a third way in the CPR policy insight published a few, a, few, a, few week, a few weeks ago. The purpose of this seminar is precisely to present and discuss the main elements of this report. Jérôme, live from Washington, will therefore brief us up for about 15 to 20 minutes on the key aspects on the French-German proposal. Jean and Henrik will then take the floor and provide their comments from a French and German perspective. Then we'll have a few polls to get your feedback um, and open the Q&A session where you participants will step in. So let me stop here, disappear, and leave the floor to Jérôme. Uh, Jérôme, can I ask you to please connect your camera and mic and to share them with the platform? Uh, I will then appear again for the Q&A. So in the meantime, Jérôme, the floor, I can see that you're dialing. Great. The floor is yours. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. OK, so it's, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here because this is you know, a, a platform where, where one feels that one can really uh, reach people across Europe at the same time. And I think in that way it is, uh, it is very unique. So as Pierre said, the way we're going to do it is that I will give you the main highlights of a paper that uh, we wrote in this group of uh, 14 uh, German and French economists, and which was published in, in January, and then um, Henrik and Jean will give some uh, additional reactions and comments, fill in a little bit uh, on, on the background. So on the opening slide, you see, you see all the authors. Um, the uh, paper was published by the CPR because we wanted a, if you like, a neutral platform uh, that didn't belong to any of our institutions and was neither French nor German. Uh, I got it. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of the objectives and strategy. I will take you through six uh, key proposals. These are, this is not everything uh, what is in the report. There are a few uh, things in addition, but it gives you the main uh, highlights. And conclude. So what are we trying to fix uh, in this uh, report? So, so first, we, we sort of share the view, which, if you like, is, is a view from, from Brussels and also um, you know, from many member states that uh, risk sharing, both private uh, through financial markets and public, is underdeveloped uh, in the current union. And so <clears throat> the uh, consequences or the, the expression of that is limited financial integration, but also a lack of common uh, fiscal civilization uh, tools. Uh, in addition, uh, we see a problem in that our approach to uh, maintaining fiscal discipline remains inefficient and politically divisive. So to make it very clear, we do not think that lack of fiscal discipline was the cause, or not certainly not the primary cause, of the euro era crisis. We, are think, we think that there are many more important things, particularly in the financial sector, than, than fiscal uh, discipline. But it is the one area which festers, which continues uh, to be a problem, uh, both in a, in a surveillance context and in a crisis context, even several years after the euro crisis, and even in the context of the economic uh, recovery. Uh, and it is a problem for, for two reasons. Uh, first, the surveillance process uh, involves fiscal rules that are very error prone, pro-cyclical, uh, require a lot of micromanagement interpretation from, uh, from Brussels because they're very complex and uh, are also hard to enforce. So we, we do not think that the system of imposing uh, or threatening penalties exposed uh, is, is a very efficient one. Uh, in addition, we have a problem that, you know, when we do end up in a very deep uh, solvency crisis, uh, we continue to hit a wall in the sense that we have no device that would implement the no bailout clause, meaning uh, allow a debt restructuring in a way that is not uh, you know, threatening for the country that needs to take that decision and for the, uh, for the neighbors, for the rest of Europe. Um, and that means that inevitably when a very deep uh, crisis happens that cannot be cured simply through conditionality and financing, uh, then we are going to resort to 
you know, some combination of financing and fiscal austerity nonetheless, uh, and uh, that uh, is going to be uh, not successful. So this is what we saw in, in Greece. Um, and so this, you know, if you like, um, uh, lack of a device of last resort it is partly what has uh, given uh, a bad name to, to the euro in the countries that had to suffer um, a very deep uh, uh, episodes of fiscal, uh, fiscal austerity and particularly in, in Greece. So the idea here is that we have uh, an inefficient approach uh, to uh, discipline and we also have underdeveloped uh, risk sharing. And, and so the, the key question is whether the attempt to fix both at the same time uh, leads to a contradiction. Uh, so can risk sharing in fact be improved without undermining discipline uh, further? And so, you know, the emphatic answer that we give in the report is that it can, uh, and it can for two reasons. First, you know, to the extent that you really believe that there is a trade-off between risk sharing and uh, incentives, we are nowhere at the efficient frontier. Uh, so we can make the system uh, more efficient. But more importantly, we think that in a deep way, there is actually no trade-off. Uh, and, and the reason is that properly designed risk-sharing agreements, and, and of course here you need to be, um, you know, look at the design carefully, actually can improve discipline because they make the no-bailout rule easier to enforce. And that, that is sort of the central theme of the report, and I'm going to get back to that uh, in a second. Now, how do we propose to fix it? So, you know, this is a in our view, pretty pragmatic and, you know, typically European report in the sense that while we do offer, I think, a very clean conceptual approach, we do not uh, force a single uh, solution. So we want to do several things at the same time in several areas, maybe also sequentially, but as a package, and jointly they're supposed to make sense. And so what is in our uh, package? Uh, first, a reform of the fiscal rules including a different way of enforcing them. And here the key idea is to switch from the current uh, rules that are focused on deficits uh, to an expenditure rule. And I will explain a bit more uh, what that means later. Uh, second, we would like a targeted role uh, for market uh, discipline. So the, the emphasis here is on targeted. Uh, we are not saying that market discipline is a cure-all. You know, market discipline often fails. But when it does fail, it fails because it is not, if you like, properly guided by an underlying system of institutions and, and rules. And, and so we want to increase market discipline in exactly two very specific ways. One is uh, as an alternative way of enforcing the fiscal rules. Uh, here we propose to uh, basically get rid of um, uh, these financial penalties or the threat of financial penalties and instead uh, ask countries that uh, do not adhere to uh, the expenditure ceilings to finance the excess of expenditure above the ceiling using subordinated bonds. I will also get to that a bit later. And then finally, we want to make the Nobel Act rule of the European treaties uh, uh, credible as a last resort when and only when debt is unsustainable. So again, we're not opposed to ESM programs, you know, in the, in the, uh, the bailouts for us do not mean, or rather the no bailout clause for us does not mean that you cannot have financial assistance from one uh, European twin country to another or from central institutions of the European uh, Union or institutions such as the, as the ESM to individual countries. But it does mean that when you know that the country is not going to be able to repay, you should insist on a debt restructuring as a precondition or as a part of the reform package. And then we have, uh, you know, several proposals in the risk sharing area, including financial sector reform, where we uh, advocate a, a particular approach to European deposit insurance, uh, obviously capital markets union. We advocate a fiscal capacity that you can uh, interpret as an unemployment uh, reinsurance fund, if you like, but it is a bit broader than that. It is effectively a rainy day fund with uh, several potential purposes. We want to broaden a uh, condition of access to ESM for pre-qualified countries. Uh, pre-qualified means that you adhere to the fiscal uh, rule and to some uh, you know, basic standards of, of conduct in the structural area, uh, like not ignoring uh, country-specific recommendations uh, on a systematic basis, for example. 
think we also make a cautious pitch uh, for a safe asset based on uh, a diversified sovereign debt portfolio. Uh, and we give the idea of uh, Markus Bonamar and his co-authors of, of creating uh, a security that is backed by a diversified pool of sovereign bonds and issued in, in several tranches. Uh, we, we use that as a leading example. Uh, we're not saying there not, may not be other ideas. In fact, I, I have, I'm working on other ideas. And there are, but this, this could be a viable uh, option. And then finally, we want to strengthen the role of institutions at, at, at two levels. So we want to give a much bigger role in the administration of the fiscal rule to the national level, and that requires independent national fiscal institutions. And we also want to strengthen the European level uh, at, at, at two ways, uh, by strengthening the surveillance process, uh, and particularly by separating the watchdog function of the European Commission from the political decision-making function, and by reforming and strengthening the ESM. Uh, so I will take you through that uh, briefly. Now, before I get into the main points, let me give you sort of the general logic of, of what we are trying to do. So, you know, the, the premise here is that fiscal externalities are important uh, in a currency deal, as are financial sector externalities. Financial sector externalities, we have effectively gone for bank union uh, and hopefully capital market union uh, in, the, uh, in the future. Uh, with respect to fiscal externalities, it's harder. Right? There is a, a much bigger uh, problem with going to full fiscal union because uh, that really develops, uh, involves a, a deep uh, issues of national sovereignty. And what, what all we do in the report here uh, assumes that politically um, the uh, euro area and the EU are going to stay roughly as they are now. So we do not premise anything on a big push towards more political integration. And so in that context, uh, you're going to have fiscal externalities, uh, and they arise from the fact that you know, you have a common central bank. That was the original uh, argument for having fiscal rules, the Maastricht idea. So to avoid monetization a risk that comes from governments effectively pressuring uh, the ECB to monetize debt. But, you know, at least as important, in my, in my view, and I think in, in that of, of most of my co-authors, uh, is really nomination risk. So the big difference between uh, fiscal externalities outside and inside a currency union is that if you have a really deep fiscal crisis, this can threaten your membership in the currency union. And if you uh, are forced to exit, then others may be attacked and forced to exit as well. So that is really the source. Now, um, if you do not have a full fiscal union, you can try to ameliorate these externalities uh, with fiscal rules and coordination devices. And that has been sort of the Maastricht uh, approach. But you're not going to be fully successful. And so you need a sort of anchor, a fallback position, in case these devices fail. Uh, and the EU treaty actually um, you know, has this logic embedded. And in the EU treaty, the anchor is the no bailout clause. And of course, the interpretation of the EU treaty is no bailout clause within the currency union. So the consequences of not being bailed out are not supposed to be uh, that countries are kicked out uh, of the uh, currency union. Uh, but that uh, current system is currently not, not credible, and we have seen that in, in Greece. Uh, so when you really get to a point that a country cannot be restored to solvency through a mixture of even very ample financing and uh, fiscal adjustment, then to the extent that we have uh, debt restructuring at all in the current system, they come too late, and they may then threaten the... Um, the uh, membership of the country in, in the euro. The alternative, uh, namely to bail out that country, is a violation of the no bailout clause, and it uh, is not something that would lead to a sustainable state. Uh, so you, you can think of it as an alternative, but it's not really an anchor uh, to just go ahead and, and, and do the bailout. And presumably, it would also threaten the stability of the currency union over the longer term, but on the other side, because you know, countries that view themselves as uh, creditor countries that have to pay for these bailouts would at some point uh, want to exit. Okay, and so we do need a device uh, that makes the bailout clause uh, uh, credible. 
Now, so far, if you look at points one to four on this slide, points one through three are simply stating what is in the logic of the Maastricht Agreement. Point four, which is to um, propose debt restructuring, some sort of uh, debt restructuring mechanism as a device to make the bailout clause credible, is, if you like, a Germanic idea. So in the debate, this is mostly what you hear from, from Germany, and Netherlands, uh, and Finland, countries uh, that are traditionally uh, creditor countries, fiscal surplus countries. Okay, what really is different in our report is how we want to go about this. So the typical approach to saying we need to make debt restructuring more credible is to say we need stronger commitment devices not to bail out and hence force countries into a restructuring when debt is in fact unsustainable. And, and so uh, importantly, this report does not go down that route. Uh, and instead, the logic of the report is that if you want to make it easier to live with a rule that occasionally forces you to do unpleasant things, then what you need to do is to make the consequences of living by that rule less unpleasant. Uh, and so what we advocate in the report is a financial architecture which limits the disruptions of debt restructuring on the debtor and on other bystander countries through an array of, of measures, um, including reducing back exposures to their sovereigns, but also through a, a, a set of risk sharing and stabilization mechanisms. So that is the key point. So uh, when I presented this a few weeks ago, uh, I used an analogy. Uh, because I saw sort of a bunch of, of people uh, in the room that, according to their age structure, could be young parents. And so the analogy that occurred to me is, you know, when you're a young parent, they sometimes tell you you're not supposed to uh, pick up your child when it falls. So, you know, you're on the playground uh, and your child falls and you're not supposed to pick it up. Now, what, what do you do if the child hurts itself? So most parents are not going to live by their uh, no bailout rule to not pick up their child. They're going to run there and pick it up. So how do you make the no bailout rule on the playground more credible? So fundamentally, there are two approaches. There is the tough commitment device approach, which is let's tie the parents to the mast, right, like Ulysses. So let's actually put a fence around the playground, okay, leave them outside, not allow them in. Uh, in case the child uh, falls. Now, that in the moment where the child actually gets hurt, it's not going to work, right? Because the parent is going to jump over the fence or the parent is not going to agree to that a tough rule in the, in the first place. But there's another approach, which is to put padding on the floor of the playground, so a rubber mat. And in that case, you know, the consequences of the child falling are such that even with a very small commitment device, which is simply that you, 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 know, you remember, you remember what, you, uh, what you have been taught. Um, you see other parents maybe uh, watching you. With these things, uh, you have enough uh, to actually go and, and make up on, on your commitment. And so the approach of this report is to make the bailout, the no bailout principle more credible by putting in lots of padding. Okay? So that's basically what we're trying to do. And that's really what's new, right? So in the past, there have been calls for strict enforcement of the no bailout calls and calls for more risk sharing. But we, as far as we, we, we know, we are the first uh, to really connect these two things and saying you need one to do the, to do the other. Uh, in addition, we are, I think, the first to propose uh, some um, designs on specific elements um, of uh, risk sharing arrangements that uh, could deal with some of the obstacles uh, that have stood in the way of the implementation of, of these ideas before, and that applies particularly to European deposit insurance, to the regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures, and also to what one might call the debt restructuring uh, regime. So here we, we think we, we have, even if you just look at the individual components, some new material. Okay, so let me quickly take you through these individual components. So the first uh, is the, we have quite a lot on the financial sector. Some of it is about dealing with legacy LPLs, um, some of it is about capital market union. I'm not going to cover that uh, now. I'm just going to pick out the most important building block, 
which is this idea to break the doom loop between sovereigns and banks and to do it from both sides. Um, and so one uh, involves uh, reducing uh, sovereign exposures of banks uh, to their uh, national sovereigns. Uh, and so here, the idea is to do this not through a capital charge, not through risk weighting, because these would have you know, pretty massive redistributional consequences in the, uh, in the euro area, and because it also relies on a system that would you know, get those risk weights right, that would not be pro-cyclical. But instead, we uh, advocate an approach that is purely about penalizing concentration. So you would in, uh, have to pay a capital charge as a bank if your exposure uh, to an individual sovereign exceeds uh, a certain amount. And this would not be a hard limit, but it would be uh, smooth. And so the important implication of, of this is that apart from the fact that it, it should not have at least ex ante exposed, it can have, depending on how banks uh, actually react, that it should not have redistributional consequences. The, the important implication here is that this should not reduce the aggregate demand for sovereign assets from the euro area banking system, right? So you're going to get a reshuffling of holdings, but not an aggregate reduction of sovereign exposure. And that, of course, makes the transition to the new regime um, much easier than if you had a, uh, an aggregate reduction, where you, then you have to worry who's going to hold the, the bonds that used to be held in the banking system, and is this going to cause a run uh, or not? Uh, the uh, second uh, key element that we propose is a European deposit insurance. And so uh, the idea here is to have a system that looks exactly like EDIS and functions from the perspective of the insured depositor exactly like EDIS in the uh, European Com the Commission proposal, and I mean at the last stage, and the fully mutualized stage of the European Commission proposal. So it is like EDIS on the outside. The important thing is that you get equal protection as a depositor, regardless of the country that you sit in and regardless of how your country has behaved. But within this entity, we want to have a waterfall structure for how uh, losses are covered. So there would be national compartments and a mutual compartment. And the national compartments would absorb the first loss. And then after the national compartment has been depleted, the mutual the compartment would provide the backing and, if you like, the catastrophic uh, loss and insurance. We also uh, would like uh, to see risk-based insurance premiums based on structural indicators uh, of the financial system and um, the legal system that are important uh, for the solvency of, of banks. And so good incentives, the, you know, the primary concern uh, of, of Germany and other countries here would be maintained both by uh, the principle that that at the national level would continue to have skin in the game, uh, and the fact that risk insurance premium could be could be uh, differentiated. Okay, uh, the expenditure rule uh, would work uh, as follows: so you would have national fiscal councils uh, that would define a medium-term debt reduction target, uh, and that would be uh, depend. You know how ambitious you are would depend partly on how far you have to go, but also a broader analysis of fiscal sustainability. So you know, a country that has done uh, major pension reforms, like, like Italy, for example, should get credit uh, for that. The same uh, official councils would also forecast medium-term potential uh, output growth. And then you would set an expenditure growth ceiling uh, as the sum of potential output growth, uh, the inflation target, and a debt correction, right? So uh, it would be uh, uh, lower, uh, so expenditure growth would be lower than the sum of potential output growth and inflation uh, if you uh, intend to lower uh, your debt and you know, the speed um, uh, with which you want to lower it uh, would, uh, would matter. Now, importantly, for this system to work, so uh, for to effectively prevent that the discipline that the system instills is undone by tax uh, uh, changes, you need to um, adjust the expenditure ceiling if the country undertakes, if the government undertakes tax reforms uh, that uh, impact uh, the deficit in, in steady state, in equilibrium. 
right? So if there is a big uh, tax cut ahead of an election, for example, the expenditure ceiling would have to be uh, lower. So this system does require quite a lot of monitoring. Um, so it's not, in that sense, it's not uh, super easy. What it does not require is uh, cyclical adjustments, right? So you, you do need to estimate potential output growth. You do not need estimates of potential output levels. You do need not you need, don't need to make cyclical corrections in real time. Right? And this makes a big difference because estimating potential output growth is much easier. It's a much more stable entity than, than getting the cyclical position right uh, in, in real time. And of course, you know the big uh, uh, the big advantage of this system uh, relative to one that is based on deficits is that it is inherently acyclical. So if you go through a boom phase where you suddenly have a lot of revenue, you're not quite sure whether they come from, you know, but they massively reduce your deficit. You are not allowed in this system to raise expenditure uh, to, if you uh, in a sense to. Um, to spend those uh, extra tax dollars, right? So your expenditure ceiling is fixed unless the cause of your revenue uh, uh, increase has been a tax reform, right? Tax rate increases or broadening of the tax base. Then you can spend it, but not if it is simply economic developments that are driving this. And conversely, if you are in a recession and your revenue collapses, then you're not supposed to adjust the spending either. Right. So you just keep it, you watch the deficit grow, you might get nervous, but that's the uh, logic of this, uh, this rule. Now, as I mentioned, um, we want to enforce this in a different way from the current uh, stability and growth market penalties. So we would abolish the current uh, apparatus involving escalation and sanctions. Instead, uh, we would like to uh, ask and have countries commit through the EU regulation that implements the new system to issuing uh, junior bonds um, to finance any expenditures that are in excess of the ceiling. So, so the key uh, thing here is that, you know, issuing these junior bonds would normally be more expensive than issuing uh, standard bonds. However, it, the the price uh, of issuing them will be uh, will depend on the credibility on uh, of why of, of the general fiscal strategy of the government on, on the reasons why the government uh, violated. The rules. So, if if the, the government violated the rules for the right reasons, you know, one would have some hope that if it can explain this to markets, the penalty would would be very low. Uh, if it did not, uh, the penalty might be higher. Uh, the other essential difference to the current system is that it doesn't really require any discretion, particularly no political discretion, uh, to actually make this penalty uh, if it is one a stick. So. There's simply a stipulation that you, you have to do this, which is enforced through the, through the standard European um, uh, legal system. Okay, uh, I've already talked about making the no bailout rule credible. So the, the important thing here is that when we talk about a sovereign debt restructuring regime, what we mean primarily is the padding. So this is not the usual way in which people talk about it, right? So for us, the key element is reducing these financial and economic disruptions associated with debt restructuring. So, you know, the reduction of concentrated sovereign exposures, the deposit insurance, the fiscal capacity, which I'll end with in a second, they are part of this regime. In addition, you need two relatively minor changes. One is a legal device to protect sovereigns against holdout creditors. This could be done through an extension of the existing collective action clauses in uh, European bonds. And then a more IMF-like ESM that is able to develop its own lending policies and stick to them. And so, in particular, what we do not embrace is a hard commitment device like automatic debt restructuring as a precondition for ESM access. So we do not argue uh, for that. What we argue for is, if you like, constrained discretion through a rule along the lines of the exceptional access policy of the IMF, that when you're pretty sure that the country might be and might not be able to repay even after going through an ESM program, you extend maturities and then you keep the object open of doing a deep restructuring in the future. Okay, I'm not going to go into the European uh, safe asset because that's well known. We effectively uh, endorse at least piloting uh, something like the, like the SPs. Uh, and let me end with this. Uh, so we uh, would like a fiscal capacity. The way we imagine this is as a reinsurance fund for large shocks. So you would need some 
pre-qualification to be able to use this, like you know, respect of the fiscal rule. Um, it would have a reinsurance characteristic in the sense that you need a sufficiently large change in some state variable, so it could be employment, it could be unemployment, to actually trigger a payment. Uh, when the payment comes, it would be a one-off transfer over one or two years. There would be some conditions related to the use of funds. Uh, this is mostly to uh, prevent countries from saving the money. So this is not conditionality in the sense of an ESM program, uh, but it just says, look, you have to use it either for unemployment benefits or for public investment. And depending on how you uh, design this, it would be an unemployment uh, reinsurance fund or, or not. And then, importantly, the national contributions should, in some sense, be linked to the probability that you're actually going to benefit from this thing, right? And so you could uh, do it by looking at the volatility of the trigger variable and linking that to the level of contributions, or you could do it exposed by experience rating the contributions. So countries that uh, access the fund more frequently should that their, their uh, insurance premium should go up. So it's a completely standard insurance device. And uh, incentives are nonetheless preserved through three things, this pre-qualification, the reinsurance character of the fund, and the experience rate and uh, contributions. Okay, so that's a, a basic uh, the, the, the report. So the central idea is that risk-sharing arrangements can be designed to be consistent with good incentives uh, and uh, by creating such arrangements, one can make the Nobel Agreed credible and remove a source of division and political polarization. And, you know, the consequences of that is we would like to see as a, as a package, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything needs to be implemented at the same time. So some of those reforms could go before others, and that's true particularly for the financial sector reforms. Thank you. I'm done. Okay, um, so um, again, thank you for organizing this, and uh, we're very happy to have this opportunity. This should be an opportunity for, for dialogue, and uh, therefore I will be extremely brief. Uh, just to complement what Jeremy said, uh, with a few words on how we worked, uh, you know, we were a group of people who came to this issue with a shared uh, perception of the risk that the uh, discussion will not result in a very ambitious compromise. Um, I think that was uh, perhaps also the perception of uh, the participants in this, uh, in this call. Um, and um, we were also certain that um, in order uh, to you know, go beyond the usual midpoint, um, there is a need to cross uh, the red lines on, on both sides. Uh, and so, by approaching uh, those issues uh, with red lines, as it, it is usually done, so basically, you know, uh, the German would say, uh, we don't want um, the uh, fiscal discipline as it is um, uh, currently organized to be uh, questioned, um, and we don't want uh, transfers, and the French would say, we don't want any sort of uh, restructuring, uh, then the, the, the space for a compromise becomes extremely narrow. Um, and there is no room for something creative. So basically, we said, okay, let's uh, accept to cross the red lines. Let's, uh, you know, uh, go for um, what you wouldn't normally accept, and let's try to build a compromise that would be both politically balanced between uh, different views, but also, um, and I think Jeremy uh, rightly emphasized that in uh, several points, um, that, but also that would uh, create complementarity. So. He uh, mentioned uh, some, let me, for example, mention on, on stabilization, that the more you go in the direction of market discipline, the more uh, states uh, could, um, you know, um, get fearful of the consequences of, uh, of a possible market reaction, and the less stabilization they will provide. So there is a risk of under-provision of stabilization. And to address risk, this risk, uh, we, we have two uh, instruments. One is this fiscal capacity uh, that, would, um, that would provide uh, one-off transfers to countries suffering from a major shock. And the other one is uh, this uh, liquidity uh, window at the ESM for countries that pre-qualify. So that's very much the spirit of what we're saying. You know, on the one hand, uh, you know, accept that there is more market discipline. On the other hand, uh, the counterpart should be more stabilization. Um, now, a word on the uh, reactions. We've been criticized. Um, we've been criticized from 
various um, you know, uh, angles and perspectives. Some saying uh, we are conceding too much uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know transfers. I mean, some um, colleagues. Uh, I mean, some reaction we've got said. Um, uh, there should be no uh, additional transfer as we envisage them, even 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 one off, even uh, even if we are very clear that there should be no permanent transfer, but even temporary transfer are considered um, uh, excessive. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, uh, the opening the, the possibility of uh, debt restructuring as a last resort in case of uh, unsustainability and making the Nobel out uh, close credible in this regard, or um, <clears throat> um, making it clear that banks uh, must diversify and that concentration charges will um, I give a strong incentive to, to bank for to diversify away from their, their own sovereign was considered too dangerous and too something that would weaken the banks. So um, um, I think we, we've got uh, uh, you know, criticism on, on, on various side. But what's important is that um, I think, and I'll stop here, that the proposals uh, um, may not be something uh, everybody agree on, but they are, I think, contributing to opening a broader and deeper uh, discussion on what's needed in terms of reforming the euro area. Uh, they are taken seriously. They are taken seriously by um, experts. They are taken seriously by um, governments. They are taken seriously by European institutions. And they regard it as a contribution to the kind of, of uh, debate we should be having. So in this respect, I think the paper is fulfilling its role. Thank you, Jean-Henrik. Now, so what I wanted to say is I would like to focus on the political points. Jeremy has presented the report in a very detailed fashion. But what's really important, I think, is to look at the political um, uh, moment in time and to see why this is important. Um, it's a bit counterintuitive that we are in a phase in which the euro area is doing well and people say there is no need for reform. At the same time, it's interesting, I watched the, re the first poll question that the participants got and 100% of you out there agree that there is a need for fundamental EMU reform. So this complacency issue doesn't seem to be the driver in the discussion any longer. But then you need to find the right approach. And I think what we started to do in the group is we wanted to make Deauville work. So when the Deauville agreement took place, um, many people criticized it as uh, actually having contributed to the euro area crisis. But when we look back today, the big disagreement in the euro area is some people say we have moved away from the no bailout uh, context and from a context in which you can't have restructurings um, to a very new regime. Now, the German or northern side of Europe has always disagreed and said, no, we're still in the old Maastricht context. And I think what this group tried to do is find a politically viable compromise that allows to take the Deauville agreement and say, how can we make restructurings work? How can we find a context that does not lead um, to a redenomination risk and that does not uh, build chaos and uh, contagion in the euro area? And uh, so the key point really is to get the redomination risk out of the euro area by implementing those reforms. A second political point that is important, I think, for this type of discussion is what we've presented is relatively technical. And uh, many politicians will struggle to understand what we've presented and uh, uh, translate this into broader political action. Still, we think this is absolutely necessary to have a technical discussion because the discussion so far has always been on the catchwords. Do you want the no bailout clause? Do you want euro bonds? Do you want a safe asset? Do you want uh, sovereign debt restructurings? And we really felt when discussing this in the group that you needed to go all the way down to the technical details to make this compromise work. And here it is. It's a package. Um, even in the group, uh, it took us a long time to find this package. But once it's on the table, it's important that it stays a package and that we do not do cherry picking or say uh, that you can only uh, focus on one half or the other. And uh, this other question that was asked to the uh, participants was, do you think it's balanced? Uh, do you think it's too focused on risk sharing or too much on market discipline? It's interesting. 50% of you say it's balanced. Uh, roughly 20% say it's too focused on risk sharing. And 30% uh, say it's too focused on market uh, discipline. And so you see this type of discussion context even in the group here. And uh, I think these numbers show that, yes, it's a compromise, but we think it's a good compromise.
So we'll leave a few a few seconds to the participants to uh, react to the poll question. Here we go. So there are the different. I mean, a few selected measures of the of the proposal which are put down, and we can see people answering. There seems to be a lead for the digital structuring as potential part of the ESM program. Then I, maybe I can ask you to to react to one of the earlier polls, which is which was saying, yeah. uh, do you, we ask participants, do you recommend to use the proposal I as would. a starting point for a political discussion? And what seems positive is that 90% are saying yes. That's very positive. Yeah, that's very positive. Um, and it goes together with the answer to the question um, about the the risk that uh, discussions will result in an insufficiently ambitious compromise, for which um, to which 88% of the respondents said yes. So really, that's um, the vote in favor of the kind of approach we are advocating. Instead of having this uh, huge legal apparatus of rules. Um, based on uh, nominal deficits, structural deficits, etc., all this legislation uh, bit, um, on, uh, you know, that forms the stability and growth pact, there should be something much simpler that would give much more autonomy and much more responsibility to national governments uh, with a, a rule that would be, be based on, um, on an expenditure that would be less subject to disturbances linked to mismeasurement of the structural deficit or the, the position in the cycle. Um, and that would give the freedom to government to uh, actually, um, you know, go beyond what the rule uh, uh, prescribes. Uh, but uh, then at his own risk uh, by uh, issuing junior bonds, which in my view is a fundamental change in the way fiscal discipline would be implemented. And I'm surprised that um, you know uh, many of you seem to consider that it wouldn't be very important. I think it would be extremely important technically, economically, and politically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Henrik, and Just very briefly, Roman, I think like it's, um, now, it's really we, fascinating to see the answers to that question of the most yeah, important please. elements. Obviously, it's a package. But um, look at EDIS. Um, it's 11%. Um, sovereign concentration charges, which is relatively technical, 20%. Um, but the um, debt restructuring as part of a potential, um, as potential part of an ESA pro ESM program, 44%. And this goes back to the Deauville point I tried to make earlier on. I think everyone in Europe realizes in the euro area, not only in Germany and the north, that it is important that debt can be restructured. And uh, Jerome, Jerome means very colorful. Uh, metaphor of the parents uh, uh, being tied to the mask. I won't forget that, Jeremy. The parents being tied to the mask and the padding on the floor is exactly that. So countries must be allowed to fall, but the padding must be there so that there is no injury taking place. And this is perhaps the biggest lesson we've learned from the um, euro area crisis in the past year, uh, in the past years, that this was not possible. And uh, perhaps the other key message then we have is even today, it's probably not possible to have a simple debt restructuring in the euro area uh, because we would uh, run into real difficulties. This is why the reform is so important um, to prepare for the next crisis. If we wait until the next crisis and only do the reforms then when a risk uh, moment is, uh, is there and uh, debt restructuring is necessary, then we probably are not in a position to ring fence uh, the debt restructuring in a way that would, would uh, uh, actually prevent the injuries we don't want to see. Thank you. So there is a first question on the expenditure. Should we start answering questions? Yes. Let's let me take the, the two. Let me take the the question on on the fiscal rule. Please. So one question is: uh, Doesn't the expenditure rule limit the choice of a country regarding the size of its public sector? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, we explicitly say that uh, if a government wants to raise taxes uh, and uh, increase expenditure, it's fully free to do it. So um, the, the expenditure rule is net on, uh, of new taxes, uh, you know, increase or decrease. Um, the um, um, excess, what we consider the excess spending that has to be financed by junior bonds only applies after you have uh, taken into account the implication of uh, higher or lower uh, taxes. Um, so that's one thing. Um, there was another, sorry. Um, just uh, 
trying to find, yeah. Uh, National Council, will they be really independent from national governments? Uh, I think that's, a, that's a, an important question. Uh, they, they have moved in this direction already. Uh, they need to more, uh, move uh, more. Uh, and um, something is we don't um, uh, make uh, explicit in the proposal is how the transition uh, to this new regime would be managed. Uh, clearly, um, in order to, if we give more role to national fiscal council, so if there is a decentralization of fiscal discipline, um, it should be uh, made uh, clear that this can only happen um, if credible institutions are put in place. So there, there needs to be a, a gradual move depending on the, uh, the quality uh, in terms of uh, institutions and perhaps the record of, of national institutions. So we're not t suggesting to replace from one day to next the current system by this new system, but we can perfectly envisage uh, a gradual uh, move. Um, and um, for uh, last point I'm going to address and the uh, demand for accountability bonds. Yeah, accountability bonds uh, will be uh, most likely um, um, issued in, in very small amounts and actually it's, uh, it's desirable that they are issued in small amounts. Uh, so the market for them will be, will be thin um, and um, but uh, and and we don't know exactly how they will be will be priced. Uh, that's definitely the case. But um, and some government may well decide that they're not going to issue uh, junior bonds. Uh, but we shouldn't rule out the possibility that the government uh, does it and you know uh, taking the risk of uh, being subject to market assessment. Okay, thanks. Um, can I? Ask the question of uh, the EDIS to Jerome, maybe. So the question is, would a waterfall solution in EDIS not reduce the credibility transfer, which, for example, Italy expects from it? Uh, that is the expectation to make the Italian banking sector safe. And so, so uh, absolutely not. I mean, the, the, the purpose of the design is equal protection for uh, all depositors, regardless of the country in which they reside, regardless of, um, uh, of uh, the policies of their government. Uh, and, you know, the incentives and implications of that very strong statement. So the reasons why, you know, we hope that Germany might be able to sign up to a proposal like this is because we have a waterfall structure where the first loss is going to be borne by a national compartment. Now, that national compartment would be filled by contributions from Italian banks, and you know, to the extent that uh, Italian banks have uh, an interest in uh, in not having uh, that money be used up too quickly. And again, remember, we we have sort of this notion that with higher risk, the contributions would go up. Uh, they will have to exert uh, then pressure on their government to make changes. Right. So this is the this is the um, uh, incentives friendly structure. But the point is that regardless of the size of your national compartments, regardless where you, whether you got the contribution rate for the right or not, at the end, if the national compartment is empty and uh, there are still uh, depositors uh, that um, uh, you know, need money to, to uh, make good on the guarantee, they would get paid from the mutual compartment. Uh, so it is fully backed. Okay. Thank you. You're back. There, um, there is an interesting question about the acyclicality of the fiscal rule, and the question is whether we don't want them to be more countercyclical. Now, it's important to note that our um, expenditure rule is net of interest rate payments, uh, interest payments, but also net of unemployment um, spending. So the countercyclical component is taken out. And in that sense, we allow for a strongly countercyclical fiscal policy, but still keep the rule um, relatively acyclical. And this is exactly what you want in a right fiscal environment. You want governments to focus on the steady state, but allow for countercyclical adjustments. And in that sense, I think this is much, much more favorable to what we currently have. Also, um, just to clarify, um, the calculating the potential growth rate is much easier than calculating the output gap. The two are related, but we are 
have much more reliable um, potential growth data than, um, than overall output uh, gap data. The other point which I find interesting is an interesting question um, by someone asking whether sovereign deconcentration, um, as it's phrased, uh, uh, might have an effect on polit towards uh, an effect on political commitment towards creditors. And to some extent, yes, but that's good. So what we want to have is more market discipline. We want markets to actually uh, adjust to the willingness of governments to pay back their debts. And in that sense, taken out, taking out the political commitment might be a good thing. Um, we have to go through a trans transition phase, but overall, I think this is this is actually quite welcome. If we believe in market discipline and we believe in the uh, no bailout role, uh, rule, then we really want this kind of um, um, direct connection between the markets, the pricing of the bonds, and the likelihood of uh, debt restructuring. There is an institutional question. From can I can I compliment on the? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, can I compliment on the question on the uh, the fiscal policy, um, you know, the new consensus, uh, sort of the new view of uh, Fuhrman. Um, I mean, we the, our proposal would make uh, fiscal policy uh, less procyclical, more countercyclical, but it wouldn't be wouldn't go very far, um, uh, as I understand the question, um, into making the fiscal policy. A, sort of an active tool of stabilization at the aggregate euro area level. Um, uh, we uh, discussed the possibility of having a eurozone budget um, that would play this role um, with a common capacity to borrow. Um, and uh, the reason why we didn't agree on it was not that um, there was a disagreement as regard the potential desirability of, of it from a macro standpoint. So not not you know that we objected to this view on fiscal policy, but simply that the institutional, um, political, um, democratic underpinning of having a common European budget are not are not there. So we explicitly say, you know, we don't think at this stage we can propose something of this sort uh, without you know going much beyond. Uh, what's uh, available uh, in the current uh, institutional so setting. I think it's a very important and well-taken question. There is also one element of the fiscal rule, as we imagine it, that would help in a zero lower bound situation, and that is that the expenditure ceiling would be calculated based on target inflation, not actual inflation, right? So if you run into a zero lower bound situation, mm -hmm. typically, uh, actual uh, and indeed expected inflation is going to be below target uh, that automatically would give more fiscal room uh, to everyone uh, in the system. So so that is a little bit of a reassurance, even though it's correct that is it doesn't really give you, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't give you space for discretionary stimulus beyond your so, so you're right on, on that one. But you know, okay. on this one, I would say, well, if you are in a situation like that, let's agree to violate the rule. Um, we're going to issue junior bonds, but markets will understand that these are exceptional times. And, 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 we'll... and that's the answer to the question yeah. whether the junior bonds uh, don't fulfill the same um, function as the sovereign concentration charges. Politically, they clearly don't. Um, because as a government, the moment you decide to overstep your expenditure um, target, you have to issue your junior bonds. So in the politically, political debate, this is directly visible, and the costs for additional projects you might want to finance with these bonds are different. Now, the sovereign concentration charges obviously might affect the overall pricing of bonds, but um, they affect the spending um, uh, or the interests uh, flatly for the entire um, outstanding debt. So in that sense, it's actually two very different tools, and uh, the junior bonds are politically a very powerful tool that a government that decides, uh, you know, I overspend my target simply has to pay more for this, and every citizen directly sees the share of junior bonds that is out there. Okay, there was Andrea's question, which was uh, quite political and institutional, on the political difficulties in uh, in strengthening the role of the institutions, e.g., ESM and uh, the Commission. And to that, maybe you can also mention. Because I think you, you don't really engage with the with the commission package of December in the in the paper, probably because it's been written also in parallel. Uh, but the package was still a, a quite a, a big chunk of proposals on turning the ESM into an EMF, 
uh, there was a bit of institution competition going on still there. So maybe you'd like to, to react to, to this together. I can say a few words on, on that. Um, no, we don't go in the in the detail of the institutional uh, aspects, um, as in the Commission proposal. But we do disagree on, on one point, uh, which is um, that we don't agree with giving um, the Commissioner, um, the ECFIN Commissioner, the, both the role of uh, overseeing um, fiscal discipline and of uh, chairing uh, the Eurozone Council and of being, in fact, the uh, Eurozone Finance Minister. Uh, we think that this is too much for a, a single person and that there is a need um, uh, to, you know, s separate the, um, uh, the monitoring of uh, the fiscal situation of the countries involved from the political decision making uh, whenever uh, the issues of uh, you know, sanctions uh, to be decided. Now, clearly our system uh, reduces uh, significantly the role of potential sanction because uh, of this uh, system with junior bond and the possibility for countries to take their own responsibilities. But nevertheless, the question remains uh, of uh, what, uh, how to manage the balance between those, those two roles. Um, we uh, mentioned two possibilities, one uh, which would be to give this prosecutor role to the, um, to the uh, ESM, uh, but also one that would keep it uh, with the Commission, which is actually the current role of the Commission, and the treaty gives its role to the Commission, but on the condition that they, there would be a separation within the Commission of, the, of those two roles. So there, there would be a possibility of having uh, the um, Eurozone Council chaired by a commissioner and having another commissioner who would be responsible for uh, monitoring the fiscal situation and bringing the evidence uh, to, the, to the Council whenever a political decision um, is needed. Okay. Enric, I have a question there about your other questions. Um, yeah. The likelihood one, please, yeah. of, a, um, of implementation of the policy proposal. First, um, as of today, I think uh, the chances of the SPD voting yes are higher than the chances of the SPD voting no. And then obviously, it's the first time that a um, German coalition treaty has Europe in its first chapter. Um, the coalition does not signal which kind of direction they want to take, but they're open to negotiate. And so on. in that sense, yes, absolutely, this grand coalition is clearly um, could become the basis for a very straightforward discussion with France. On the other hand, you should not forget um, that this is a very tiny uh, time window. Um, in the fall, uh, the land of Bavaria will have regional elections in Germany. Um, this is not a very good context to agree to cross red lines in Germany. Then the European Parliament um, campaign will start. Brexit will be on everyone's minds towards the end of the year. And then, obviously, everyone will have to wait until the new commission is in place. The ECB president and board will have changed. So we are probably in late 2019 or 2020. So Merkel has understood this by saying that at the March European Council, she already wants a discussion on these issues, but there are two scenarios. One is uh, those who are opposed to reform will try to buy time and kick the can, and uh, then the other scenario is where all, everyone is serious about these reform approaches, and then um, there needs to be very quick progress until June, July of this year. So we're talking about months, uh, not about half years or years. Uh, Jérôme, do you agree? <laughs> and also Henrik knows more than anyone about this issue. Can I take maybe a few of the other uh, questions? Yes. yes, I think that uh, uh, Despina and Magnus' questions go a bit hand in hand, so maybe okay, we can take them Magnus together. Question. So it is not completely clear uh, whether what we you know, are padding uh, is going to make the debt restructuring painless. I mean, I wouldn't think so, right? So I wouldn't think that it will, it, it will make it entirely trivial. Uh, to restructure debts, but it, it, it should prevent a major uh, accident. Uh, now, having said that, you know, the question on um, wouldn't the padding in itself create moral hazard, right? And, and, and so, so this, uh, I think, uh, we are addressing through the specific design of uh, our proposals, right? So all proposals have a, a I mean, the, the, both the, uh, the deposit insurance idea and the uh, fiscal uh, uh, fund have a, a waterfall type structure uh, and 
they both um, have some pre-qualification uh, requirements and both have some relationship between risk and contributions. So I think it is basically makes them pretty much more hazard proof. I mean, I think this is the maybe the sense in which the paper is a little bit Germanic that we have been really gone out of our way to to uh, to design these things in a way that we think are consistent with good incentives. Um, uh, maybe just very quickly on Sam Langfield's question. So, so uh, there is actually a paper on uh, calibrating the concentration charges. This was a paper published by Nicolas Veron in slightly before the main report in November. It's a paper written for the European uh, Parliament on the uh, individual calibration of the uh, re uh, reinsurance of the fiscal uh, capacity. Uh, we have done some calculations, but at least a lot more work uh, needs to be uh, needs to be done. So we have to fully simulate that, that thing. And then the SPINAS point, so, so the statement in the SEPS paper, they would thus create an environment in which any idiosyncratic shock hitting a highly indebted country would push it into the arms of the European Stability ESM, where its sovereign debt would be mercilessly restructured before any financial assistance could be considered. So, so that is a real misunderstanding of, of what we do. So, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, in... 99% of the cases, the ESM would not require a debt restructuring as a precondition, right? We're talking about the Greek style outliers. And even in those cases, my, um, uh, my um, expectation is that, you know, what we envisage in the report is effectively sort of a, a three zone distinction between countries that are clearly uh, uh, unsustainable and, and should simply be restructured as a precondition for access, those that are not, and those where it is not clear, in practice would become a two-zone uh, distinction. So uh, there will always be some doubt on whether a, uh, a solvency can be restored in a, a conventional ESM program without a restructure. And so the standard case, I think, in, for, for countries where it's really, it looks very bad, would be to first seek a, um, a maturity extension without any uh, type of interest or interest rate or uh, face value reduction and then see whether that, that actually works. Uh, and only then will there be a, uh, a restructuring. Uh, on the second part of the, the sentence that the proposed lending window at the ESM does not address you know, the potential liquidity or uh, uh, a problem um, uh, that is induced, uh, this uh, be because it requires uh, basically it's only there for the for the for the good countries. So that's not that's not true, right? So so the ESM facility that uh, we propose would be uh, um, uh, accessed by countries that have respected essentially the fiscal rule and some sort of minimal uh, 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 respect for country-specific recommendations. So this is does not particularly in particular it does not disqualify countries on on the basis of of their size of their debts. So it, it would be uh, actually there as long as you don't make a gross, uh, gross mistake. Let me add something on this uh, Messori um, uh, Mikosi paper uh, published by SEPS uh, just yesterday. Uh, I'm surprised by how um, uh, the, it uh, misrepresents uh, both our, um, the spirit of our proposal, but actually our, also the, the letter of the proposal. Uh, you know, by um, basically you know, misinterpreting uh, footnotes or sentences and, and saying that essentially we would wish to uh, push for something that would be truly destabilizing and um, by making a comparison that's, uh, I think, is misplaced with the non-paper issued by uh, the German Ministry of Finance uh, some time ago. Uh, really, I mean, if you take these, these things one by one on the, the fact, you know, the way uh, banks would access liquidity, uh, um, the uh, financial stability exemption for uh, assisting uh, banks in trouble, uh, the restructuring as developed by, um, uh, by Yeromin, um, or uh, again by um, yeah, I mean the uh, the, the the way uh, the the SM would would work. Um, we're we're very far from what's uh, presented in this paper as uh, being our position. So I think there is Can a misunderstanding. I add a, a political point, which I think is important. In the north of Europe, 
and we need to use some of these categories, even if they're always or often misleading. Mm. There is now a very strong resistance to have a euro area that, in fact, has no longer the no bailout rule and always runs the risk in the next crisis of becoming a one-sided transfer union. And don't underestimate the rise of anti-Europe, anti-euro forces in Germany, in many other countries. So I think there is a real challenge for everyone to come up with a system that goes back to the original Maastricht framework um, as much as we can, but by ring fencing, as we've said, in a way that will allow us to move on. If we manage to find this type of political and economic equilibrium, then we have a real chance of making this euro area stable for the very, very long time. If we don't, then we know how the next crisis is going to be played out. We will have one of the large countries potentially in a very, very deep crisis and fierce political resistance uh, in those countries that have to provide the money. There are two ways to solve this. One is we kick this crisis country out and then the euro is at risk or is over. Or there is such a massive bailout that doesn't have political backing in the country that bails out that the political backing for the euro area is disappearing or at risk or it's no longer there. So in that sense, it's actually urgent to implement the proposals we have today on the table so that this situation, which would destroy probably the euro either way, is never going to appear. And this is why it's so important. Let me add something, because by the same token, we shouldn't underestimate the, the feeling in Italy and other parts of Southern Europe and the resentment against what is perceived as the selfish attitude of, of Northern Europe. And in this kind of situation, it is extremely important that we have uh, we're having a genuine, honest discussions that do not pander to prejudices uh, and that make sure that, you know, anything we are putting on the table is looked at uh, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, an honest proposal that you can criticize, but that you shouldn't misrepresent. Because otherwise, we're just fueling this uh, sort of, you know, uh, two narrative, um, the, the, I mean, coexistence of two opposite narratives in which it's simple, the culprit is the, the other side. Uh, that's not what we need. And exactly, you know, what we have been able to overcome in the Franco-German discussion within the group. We started from quite different positions on a number of issues, but we were able to, you know, to, to bridge the gaps because we were all dedicated to it and we wanted to have this genuine and honest Thank discussion. Thank you. Jérôme and Henrik, would you like to have closing remarks too? Okay. Jérôme? I really enjoyed it. And I thought that these were excellent questions. Thank you. Okay. Henrik? Same here. Now let's make it work. Yeah, exactly. That's a challenge. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. I think that was, uh, that was great fun. Um, this seminar is reaching its end and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, thanks to the speakers, but also thanks to uh, all of you for the questions. Um, there will be more online seminars of this of this type in the future, so stay tuned. And uh, well, that's it. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>